So, uh, good afternoon. So, yeah, um, actually following in really nicely from Paul's talk, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about databases and data lists, and hopefully you won't all die of boredom, honestly, I promise. So, I mean, it seems really obvious to know how to protect cultural property. You have to know what it is and where it is, and then you have to tell the people engaged in operations that very crucial information. The military manual by UNESCO is written by leading cultural property lawyers, and they acknowledge this. NATO's own report came out to say that cultural property protection data layer is a critical decision support tool and a precondition for engaging. The 1954 Hague Convention tells us that it's actually a legal requirement. Article 3 talks about the safeguarding measures that uh, state parties, ministries of culture, should prepare in peacetime. Uh, and it says such measures as they consider appropriate, which I think they kind of envisaged would come out of the monuments men list that the Roberts Commission made that Nigel was talking about this morning. But actually it turns out by the 1999 second protocol they had to make it really explicit. And when they list these measures, like, no, we also mean the preparation of inventories. But that actually leads quite a lot of gaps. So the first question is that, well, where does the data come from? Who collects it? And everything gets a bit confused. So um, so the CIMIC Centre of Excellence Manual suggests that it's up to international organisations, NGOs, museum directors, not the military. The NATO publication Cultural Property Protection as a Force Multiplier lays out armed forces cultural protection obligations against different phases of a crisis and it says, right, as soon as there's an indication there might be a crisis, military planners should start collecting data. And the military manual says, well, military planners might have access to something, and if not, we'll see. You know, best practice comes in different forms. So there's no really clear guidelines out there. Well, it is a state's responsibility to collect this data. And whether an object is of importance is a question for the state on whose territory it's situated. If a state, in good faith, and I'll come back to that, considers given property is of great importance, then it's cultural property. It is protected under Article 1 of the 1954 Hague Convention. Which is great. I mean, that, that solves everything, right? <coughs> so Article 1 of the Hague Convention gives us this definition of what cultural property is. Uh, fundamentally, movable or immovable property of great importance. Buildings that exhibit cultural property, so museums and art galleries um, and you know, libraries, uh, and centres containing monuments. And then it gives a long list of examples leaving it up to the state to decide. Uh, I have a, an old list, I apologise, it's not up to date, uh, 1997. So, some examples of state practice. The Netherlands have 43,000 items on their Hague list. Bulgaria's got nearly 40, 25 for Austria. Germany has 10,000 that are stated as bearing the convention's distinctive sign, but actually what we found out group for last, that means in practice, uh, is that they apply the blue shield if it's a protected national monument and has nothing to do with the Hague Convention and is applied <laughs> at the level of the individual federal divisions, of which Germany has 16, and is not applied consistently. It's completely separate to the Hague list. So bearing the sign in Germany is not a, a relevant factor. Uh, the UK has about 18,000 on its list, and that is a short list of our property of great importance of about half a million, give or take. And Bulgaria has a protected list of about 4 million movable items of cultural property. But actually, uh, so the states, there are states that are doing it. They are, it has to be said, very much in the minority of the 130 plus states that have signed up to the convention. Only a tiny fraction have made these lists. And the problem is actually, I'm going to just flip that definition. People get really hung up on what the property is. But actually, what the convention says is it needs to be of great importance to every people. And according to the you know, legal analysis of the convention, that's really significant. Conventions are normally about states, they're about governments, and they're about diplomacy. But actually, the fact that it was about people and what mattered to them brings this very firmly back to, to take it away from objects and make it people-centric. And this was a deliberate choice. And, you know, I'm just going to actually use the Star of England as a really nice best practice because you can have countries that have this great participatory approach. If you, as you know, a member of the public, have something you think is important, great. You literally just go on the website, nominate it, and someone will come and look. It's that simple. That's fantastic. 
But alternatively, there are plenty of countries where state suppression of minority heritage is extremely common. That's a slide from Bahrain. In the 2011 uprisings, uh, the government bulldozed 540-odd Shia mosques and shrines, some of which were over 400 years old. And this is perfectly common. So it has to be a state in good faith is representing its people. And this is where you start getting into where it's militarily complex, because you have to identify what these cultural touch points are. So, for example, in Iraq in 2006, the al Asghari Mosque was bombed. In fact, it was bombed twice. The day after it was bombed, 32 mosques were bombed in reprisals, and the Iraq body count index for both civilians and troops took a massive spike. And this is where, for armed forces, it's not just about having a what and a where, it's about knowing what your cultural touch points are. The fact that this, to some people, is the fourth holiest Shia shrine in Iraq, and it is hugely significant, that bombing was credited with turning the violence in Iraq into a sectarian civil war. Now, um, so we have to identify what these touch points are. And I will say, actually, I got into a conversation about this with a heritage professional who looked at me and went, al Mosque, who cares about that? It's only an 18th century rebuild. So we have these two extremely competing value systems that are actually at the heart of how we record data to protect sites in armed conflicts. And it's actually really difficult when it comes to religious buildings. I did a kind of scout around for the UK. Um, we have about 50,700 churches, because some are owned by Church of England, and you know, different denominations have responsibility for them. There's no government management of this. In a lot of Middle Eastern countries, religious buildings are owned by the Ministry of Religious Endowments, not by the Ministry of Culture. So if you make it a cultural responsibility to collect information, you end up with a massive gap where religious buildings rarely feature, particularly as many of them are relatively recently rebuilt, so they don't take what we would traditionally think of as culturally important, as a, a sort of scientifically and historically important, even though they are extremely culturally important. Uh, I had a great conversation with Muslims in Britain trying to work out how many mosques there were in the UK. Super helpful. Because uh, we were looking to decide what counts under, because religious buildings are also protected under the Geneva Conventions and the Hague Regulations, as well as the Hague Convention. And what is a building dedicated to or used for religion? Well, this was our favourite example. Uh, Friday prayers in the kitchen of the takeaway. Protected building. Somebody will have to decide, but at some point, somebody needs to say, well, right, that is a protected building under the law, and that is not. And these are decisions we just don't even have the, the capacity to decide about yet. Cultural property then starts to move. It becomes bigger. Uh, there is a, a move now for World Heritage Sites frequently span multiple countries. So in the slide here, you can see at the Andean road system, it crosses six countries. But within each country, each road part is represented by a centre point. A tiny dot, say, and it doesn't say, by the way, the road is like, you know, however many kilometres long, you get a dot. And the preservation of cultural heritage, though, in the Hague Convention has been interpreted to transcend state boundaries. It becomes a matter of international importance, according to the preamble, because the heritage should receive international protection, and it's important for all people of the world. In an age of refugees and diaspora communities, this becomes even more significant. Communities who have left their homeland still request that states, in good faith, represent them. So you end up with situations like the Iraq Jewish Archive, which was found heavily flooded in 2003 and evacuated to America for emergency preservation. Now, it actually took them the best part of a decade to finish restoring this archive by which point most of Iraq's Jews had left, in fact, to America, and they argued it should stay there, and the Iraqi state went, this is Iraqi cultural property and we would like it back. So you end up with these very, very complicated questions of ownership that bring us back to representation and what is protected and who has the right to decide. And of course, just to be extra fun, even my states have collected their cultural property data, the Hague Convention very explicitly says just because wherever you're operating didn't do that, you're not exempt from your responsibilities. You are still obliged to try and protect cultural property. So we end up in these situations where we're going, right, well, what's over there? Uh, how do we find out? So the military manual gives pretty good advice. Um, 
When in doubt, commanders should basically go, if it looks like cultural property, treat it like cultural property. Now that's a little bit, you know, from obviously our perspective, it's a bit Western, you know, I know what a church looks like, that's great, um, I can recognise a mosque. When it comes to things like, I don't know, archaeological sites, if you go out to, say, the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, do people know what a tell looks like? It's a hill, it can be like, you know, 20, 30 metres high, it can cover multiple hectares, but it looks like a hill. And it's actually the eroded remains of a 3,000-year-old city. And it will usually have a buried city for many more hectares around it. So you end up with these real problems where people have no idea what the cultural property is, and this just forms your minimum baseline. But then if you think about that in the context of most countries who are picking what is of great importance, then if, you know, are you protecting everything or should you be looking for this subset? And I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So actually Paul just had the same slide, it's not like we ever share slides. Um, and the really important thing is even data collection and the mission sit within the laws of armed conflict. And what we need to be doing as heritage professionals is collecting data as states that supports the mission and the mission imperative. So, armed forces need to be able to distinguish, is it cultural property or civilian property, or is it a military target? Is the attack on it necessary? And the Hague Convention is full of references to the fact you can attack cultural property if there is a military need. And then is your attack going to be proportional to the advantage you expect to gain? Well, that really means you need to know more than just a, a latitude and a longitude. And then you need to look at how you can limit the damage to that site, which requires knowing a lot about the site. For example, can you use a lower payload bomb to minimise the damage and achieve your effect? Can you do an above-ground burst that won't hit buried archaeology? What can you do that will mitigate the damage? But this, again, still functions on this idea of no strike lists. The Hague Convention says armed forces must do everything feasible to minimise the attack. And that's really good, actually, because we don't have a lot of the data they need. So what's feasible? If they come to us and say, right, well, you know, what's in that country, and we don't have that information, they have done what is feasible. And at the moment, what we tend to do, uh, with exceptions, these are just some generalisations, we do a little list that might have a centre point, irrespective of the size of the site. It might have a description that can be very technical. I did work on one once with somebody who went down this list and I said, you have to describe the site, and he went, Gaza, 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 all the way down, it's like, nobody knows what that is except you, and it's a very technical term, you can't recognise it on the ground, you can't use it to tell anything about the site, this is not a practical description, we get very hung up in the technicalities, or we might do something really summarised, like a city name, Aleppo, Sana, uh, very general, and it's based on this idea that all of this will only be used for targeting. Armed forces have often told us that we have to do the shortest list possible. They don't want too much data. Uh, so in Iraq in 2003, it was 30 sites. Mali was about 400. Libya in 2011, 225. And in 2016, we revised it to about 425. And Syria was about 1,300. To give you that breakdown, though, of that, it was about 1,250 sites and about 40 museums. Uh, and some historic buildings in two cities that we had good tour guides for. No features, uh, no, you know, no road networks, nothing like that. No war graves, no archives, no libraries, storage locations and excavation houses, art collections, statues, war graves. And just to get 1,300 sites took us about four to six months. And there's been a real political barrier. If you're looking at invading a country, you can't just go to them and say, hey, can we have your data? It doesn't go down so well. And similarly, there are massive language barriers to doing it externally. It's very difficult. These things have to be done by states as early as possible so that the data is there and ready, because doing it in a hurry, it's too late. That's what the Syrian one looks a bit like. Um, you have some places there where there are lots of condensed sites, like one of those little dots is about 800 dots because it's Aleppo. That is Syria's actual archaeology. I think our list contains about 1% of it, um, and plus the vast amount of other heritage data. If you look at it, when we do cities and you just say something like Aleppo, uh, that's the size of Aleppo, that's Aleppo with its World Heritage Site boundary, which suddenly significantly reduces that area and a proposed buffer zone, ignore that. Um, but even then, when you're talking about the ability to conduct strikes that can distinguish between individual floors of buildings, the decisions that are being made are so precise and our data is so vague that it doesn't really meet the need. 
Whereas actually, what we need to be doing is collecting data on this level. Uh, this is the cadastral map of Aleppo, and the blue bits are Aleppo's actual build, uh, historic buildings. And we, but we don't have it. In most places, we don't have data on this scale. Um, enhanced protection sites are some of the most protected locations in the world. Uh, they are listed in the Hague Convention Second Protocol. And a site under enhanced protection is the only place in the world military necessity doesn't apply. A site that is placed under enhanced protection may never be taken into military use and it may not be targeted. If, and doing so is a war crime, categorically. If you do so, uh, if your opponent does so, then they are subject to the resulting war crimes and the protection is lifted long enough for you to deal with that military issue and then you are expected to withdraw from the site and its enhanced protection status resumes. But a lot of our protection does work, or our data works on the assumption that no one will ever operate there, that states will operate in good faith. But we know from the many recent conflicts that we've been involved in that plenty of state part, plenty of organisations do not operate in that level of good faith. They do not respect it. So this was just literally the first one uh, in the list of enhanced protection where we've said what the site's called, it includes 513 monuments, and there's some examples in the second column. The third column gives the site boundary, and the fourth column gives three pages of legal description about the fact it's okay to inscribe it. It's not, I would argue, the priority here is wrong. The legal, I'm sure the, the legal background is really important, but the level of detail we're giving will not actually enable armed forces, if they are forced to operate in an area like this, the amount of information that they need, because it just doesn't exist in most countries. So I would say that quite simply what we're saying, it's not feasible. Uh, when they're looking at what information is feasible to protect cultural property, I don't think it is. What we need to be looking at is a much more holistic view, to take the step back from targeting and no strike lists, to look at it in a much more holistic manner. The data that heritage professionals and ministries need to provide does do targeting, but it also the civil military liaison and civil affairs needs. Logistics. If I put my ammunition dump by this list of building unknowingly, I am still, however unwittingly, using that list of building to shield my ammunition dump. That can be a crime. I have yet to find a logistics person who's ever heard of this because it's not something people think that they need. Um, engineers have the same problem. Intelligence staff come to us and they're like, right, where are the cultural touch points? What is particularly significant to this community? And we always kind of go, well, I, I don't really know, because that's not how we collect our data. We treat it all equally. We don't rank and rate it by significance to people. Cultural property protection staff, they, they all have these very different needs for the data to actually do their jobs to protect cultural property, and they operate in multiple contexts direct armed conflict with heavily kinetic explosive uh, activity, stabilisation where you're looking at rebuilding the communities of what becomes maybe economically important, what might be looted in a, a post-conflict period where there's no money or jobs, peacekeeping, um, I had a story from Mali the other week where they said, you know, we kept driving over this area and people kept throwing rocks at us. I mean, we were supposed to be peacekeepers. We couldn't work out why they were really upset at us until we learned we were driving over an archaeological site. Now, relatively speaking, it isn't even a particularly high priority archaeological site, but it mattered to that community and that was seriously impacting that mission. People throwing rocks at them. Counterinsurgency, disaster response. There are many different contexts where different amounts and levels of information become relevant. Responsibilities for armed forces. We need to provide data that can include both you know, targeting, maneuver, and logistics, which really is more of a, a what and where, and maybe vulnerabilities. What happens if we ask them to guard sites? To what? What threats? Armed forces do get asked to evacuate museums to refuges. I have to say it was the Syrian army that evacuated the Palmyra Museum. Uh, in Lebanon, it would be the armed forces that were called in if there was a fire or a flood or a disaster, because they're the people with ca capacity giving security advice to sites, because this is a kind of threat analysis that heritage professionals are not used to doing. It's a new way of thinking. Preventing looting on sites. 60% of the sites in southern Iraq were looted following the 2003 invasion. That is a huge amount of damage. How do you prevent that? Where are those sites? What, what is being targeted on the market that might make these sites particularly vulnerable? And then what about the following illicit trafficking? 
evidence collection for prosecution? Do you know what was there before so that you can assess what was done? What Maybe was that stolen? Was it there to start with? You need that level of information. You need to be able to conduct first aid. And our forces need to worry about reputational damage as well, both their own but also what their opponent might be doing. What's the highly significant part of this site that somebody's going to come in, drape a flag over and take a selfie and win a sort of little propaganda weapon against you? And at any point they can be asked to state party support and suddenly you look at this list and you're like, I only have so many resources and I only have so many people. What are my priorities? We don't tend to prioritise though. There are 17 sites on the enhanced protection list, about 10 on the special protection list, and everything else is treated equally. We haven't really got that mindset where we have limited resources and decisions need to be made. Uh, and actually, that becomes really problematic. So the Hague Convention tells us that the, the main level of protection should be um, generic protection, a blue shield, a great importance to the heritage of people, very great importance of special protection, and the greatest importance to humanity should be placed under enhanced protection, of which apparently there are 17 or so. Uh, with more due to go through the UNESCO committee uh, in December. But it's also tied to authority to strike, so it becomes really important uh, in field operations. A battalion commander can authorise a strike on general protection, but it needs a divisional commander on special protection, and it has to go right the way to the top, to the force commander, to authorise a strike on something under enhanced protection. So there's this clear military chain of command built into that convention right from the start. So I just want to finish with a little example, actually. Um, Paul obviously put up the pictures of the um, act coping with culture in Vienna in 2018, and I ran it again about two, three weeks ago in Hamburg. Uh, we took, and I apologise to the German Bundeswehr that I forgot to put their logo on the slide. We took our participants out to the uh, World Heritage Site in Hamburg, which you can see in this slide is the area on the right-hand side that's kind of got the rows of buildings and the little green roofs, and it goes from next to the very big building at the front all the way to where it opens out at the back. And it's this area of warehouses and canals. And we basically treated it as if they were staff officers and they'd been given a general protection list. We gave them a centre point. Uh, and it's a very small area. This is one World Heritage Site, so that's perfectly normal. It's what you do, you have a centre point for your World Heritage Site in one city, in one district, in one country. Uh, and we told them they had about a day and a half. How would they protect it? Um, so it took me about three hours going through an 800-page nomination file to learn that it's 26 hectares, about a kilometre in length, uh, 300,000 metres, historic ensemble of port warehouses. And also I picked it because port warehouses are not what you would obviously think of as world heritage of outstanding value to the whole of humanity. It just makes people think a bit differently. And you get 15 warehouse blocks, six buildings, the canals, the bridges, the walkways, all part of it, uh, and some important art deco buildings just over the river with eight art large office complexes, and the cobble streets and the remnant railways. After a bit more work, we've decided that we think there's eight or nine, couldn't pin it down, despite quite a lot of looking, eight or nine museums, and two that are just outside the boundary, two World Heritage Information Centres, and actually also the Port Authority and Flood Warning System, which I would say are probably very important. It took hours to work that out. That information isn't just collected. And it's this, it is the whole together, the course, that makes it World Heritage. It's not any individual part of it, not that museum or that one or that office block, but it is the whole ensemble. It also has things that are particularly uh, economically important, like Hamburg Dungeons, which is, you know, like York Dungeons and London Dungeons and Hamburg Dungeon, which even on a very rainy, cold day three weeks ago had a massive queue outside it. So it's economically very important. We gave them a fictional scenario with insurgent forces over the river and what might they be looking to do to the site? What are you protecting it from? Right, what, where are your strategic communication points? What might people dra drape their flags over, steal, break, to make their point about like, in an identity conflict? What might they loot for insurgent funding? Where are the valuable things? And are they protected? Is there risk management in place in this site? Um, what about direct damage? Whether that is vandalism or the way that ISIS go in, strap barrels to something and blow it up. Targeted strikes from uh, a distance. What about if people were to use it for logistics or storage? Well, actually, it's a port warehouse. I mean, gosh, it's good for storage. What problems does that cause? Can you manoeuvre in it? 
not easily, full of bridges, very limited access points and little cobbled streets. What about if somebody occupied that area? What would you do about it? Uh, and fuel spillage, because that's an issue with the canals. And so we put our mix of armed forces and heritage professionals in this area and basically said to them, under the current system of how we do things, how would you protect a centre containing monuments? Given the laws of armed conflict, is it possible for you, with the information you have been able to collect in your one and a half days, to distinguish legitimate targets? Can you make proportional decisions about whether your attacks are necessary and what the means and methods of those attacks will need to be to mitigate damage to this site? And the answer was basically no. And yet we gave them a day and a half just to do one site. When you look at this on a countrywide scale, the way we collect data and how we do it and who we collect it for needs to change. And that, that's on a global level. Um, and that is the Ministry of Culture all across the world. That is that responsibility. Because quite honestly, we hardly knew anywhere that had that information. Um, you know, when it came to risk management, no one had any comprehensive view of whether all of the museums had risk management plans. They do have really good flood defences. So in a flood, they take everything into the basement and lock the door, and it's watertight. And then they leave, which works really well in a flood. But that actually is very problematic in an armed conflict because then you could just go in and take it all away again. Uh, so they don't have emergency planning that deals with these kind of threat situations. So, I mean, I felt like when we asked the question of what was feasible for armed forces to do to protect it, um, there is a large failing, in fact, by the heritage community because we've lost that ability to think strategically and about the military mission in terms of how we collect this data. And so I think there is a real role now for heritage professionals to change how we do things. And that's not easy. That is not a small ask. As I said before, it took us months to collect a tiny amount of data in one area. But I think if we're going forwards and we really want to operationalise the protection of cultural property, not just put it on a list and say, it's protected, this is the way that we need to be going in the future. Uh, thank you very much.